episode, I was muted. That's I was going to say, I couldn't hear you at first, but we're good now. <laughs> I think we're up a little bit, but it's me. It's Pat's Daily, brought to you by our good friends at Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media. And I'm back with my main mailman, Mike Cadlick, host of the Behind the Mic podcast. Now, Mike, before we get into all the fantastic mailbag questions yep. from all the fans, please let the people know about your new podcast. Had an A1 guest for your first show, the best of the Appreciate best. It. It was a fantastic episode, buddy. So please let the people uh, know about it. it was yeah, great. look, at this is uh, a plug right off the top. Usually we wait till after to do this. So I appreciate you uh, getting me into your audience. But yeah, so obviously a lot of Patriots coverage for myself working for EEI and then on the uh, the EEI Six Rings podcast. So wanted to branch off a little bit differently here. I've been thinking about doing it for a while. Um, just sort of going behind the curtain, peel back the curtain, go behind the mic, which was convenient really for the first episode with myself and ESPN's Mike Reese. But uh, yeah, just trying something on my own to uh, interview sports media personalities, not only in Boston, I want to expand as far as possible. So uh, yeah, we're going to do them once a week. So this week was Reese. Next week we have another guest, which uh, I'll leave a secret for now. But uh, yeah, so we're going to try it out and see where it goes. So if you want to uh, continue to tune in, you can follow uh, on social media at Behind Mike Pod on Twitter and Instagram. That's M-I-K-E Mike, not M-I-C. Um, and then uh, anywhere you get your podcasts, it's uh, just the Behind the Mic podcast with Mike Cadlick. And then YouTube is Behind the Mic pod as well. So uh, yeah, come along, see what you think of it. And uh, any suggestions, anyone you want on, you can obviously tweet at me or anything like that. But uh, yeah, it should be fun. So appreciate you uh, tuning in and plugging it and uh, allowing me to tell the other uh, the other Pat's Daily listeners too. So should be fun. Of course, buddy. And once again, really great first episode. If you're trying to bake into the industry, super mm -hmm. helpful. If you're already in the industry, it's still very helpful because you get to understand how other people kind of went about their starts because there's no one way to do it. Everybody's kind of got a different story. So well, that's what I think is so cool, too, is like I want to I'm curious about having these conversations anyway, people like, you know, whether with people, whether we're, you know, down in Foxborough or just like, you know, shooting the shit over text. So I was like, why not have them on Zoom, turn it into a podcast and figure other fans and people will be interested in it, too. So uh, kind of the best of both worlds there. So, yeah, no, it is super interesting because like and then we'll get to the mailbag in a second. But like with Mike Reese, right, his mm -hmm. uh, his journey, if you will, was sort of, you know, linear and like the way everyone kind of did it. You know, you start at the school newspaper, you do the internship, you grow. But then. You know, other people like even I guess our younger generation like myself, you and, uh, you know, some of our other friends on the beat, like it's so different now because things change and the podcasting's in like there's no newspaper. There's no. So, well, there's newspapers, but you get the point. Like, so I'm curious to see kind of how different people broke through and how they do it. And like you said, um, those who are, you know, trying to get into it, too, like it's it's there's there'll be some fascinating conversations down the line. So uh, so tune in and follow along. Absolutely. Like I'll say like for me personally, I thought I was going to go the regular route. Like I went to journalism school and all right. that. And it was like, I don't really know if this is for me. Maybe I'll try to get into scouting and then kind of went the, you know, follow and do sports online thing. And then, you know, just kind of turned into this right. and like, get opportunities. So there's no one. I was going to say, save your story though, because we're going to have you on the, I'm just kidding, but no, we will. Well, Taylor will be on the pod down the line. So uh, uh, it should be fun, but yeah, it's uh it'll be, it'll be an interesting thing. So. All right, so tune in. We're going to give you another plug at the end, obviously, for any of our late viewers, but that was a fun way to start. All right, now let's get into the first mailback question. What do you think of trading the 2025 second rounder into 2024 sixth for Higgins and then getting Ladd at 34? I'm guessing this is with the idea of the framework for uh, the Stephon Diggs trade to Houston. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think that Higgins stock, even though it's obvious that he's going to be traded, is higher. Yeah. Like Stephon Diggs was kind of in a similar situation where – Clearly, the Bills and him probably thought it was best to part ways, so they didn't get the, as much capital as they probably could have. Um, but Dix is also on the decline. He's an older. He's already in his 30s. And right. uh, while Higgins is younger, he's got the injury history. And again, because we know he's going to get traded, I think you know he could get sent for some significant capital. But I think you're probably going to have to be do better than a future second. I feel like it's going to have to be maybe a straight so. second or like a third and something else. I think so too. It's so funny how, and I know we have to prepare for all these questions throughout this entire mailbag because that's what people want to hear through draft season, but it's funny how we're still like more than, or a little under three weeks away, I think it is, but like, it's just sometimes it's like, oh, here we go. Like this trade scenario, this draft scenario. And I know we're going to have a lot more down the line, but uh, it's funny. Just, you know, you look at them like, I don't know. I don't know. But with this one, I'm with you. I think it's going to take more for T Higgins. Um, he is, 
it, like you said, the injury history is there, but he has proven he can be a true X. I think he's, I keep seeing people saying they're not convinced that Higgins is a number one, that he's really just a number two and, you know, looks better behind Jamar Chase. Like, I don't know. Let's, let's give this guy a chance to see what happens because even when, you know, Chase has been hurt down the stretch from some of these seasons and stuff like Higgins has still showed out. And so, um, but long story short with this scenario, if they can make it happen, I love the idea of the Patriots going to get a T Higgins or going to get a Brandon Ayuk or, being active on the trade market to bring in somebody for your rookie quarterback. Like I wrote about it yesterday uh, for WEI.com, how the the digs trade kind of made me, you know, it, it's pushing me even more and it should push them even more to go get that, you know, big high quality a one um, security blanket target for your rookie quarterback. Everybody's doing it now. They got it for CJ Stroud, Josh Allen originally with Stefan Diggs, Joe Burrow with Jamar chase. It's a little different, but uh, Tyree killed him. I am, like it just it happens. It happens. It happens. I think the Patriots should go do it too. Second part of the question: Lad McConkey at thirty four. I would love it. I think Lad is an outstanding wide receiver. I know that you're a fan of his as well. The way he gets off the um, off the line, the way he separates. He's not just a a short uh, white uh, like. And I'll just say it like a short, short white slot receiver like your Edelman's and and your. Uh, your Wes Welker's like, he's so much more than that. He can do it all. And so I think that would be a, a, a great pick for them at 34. Yeah, I agree with Lad. The big thing is just, he's not the biggest guy. Like that yeah. is a concern. He's not great in those contested catch situations or sure. he's got to body guys out, but he's much more. But skilled. when you can separate like that, you don't even have to have contested catch situations. You can right. just get off guys and you're wide ass open. And he's got more vertical juice. And like, I don't yeah. playing outside, but really he played outside where it's like you motion in or you're really in the stack or exactly. Bunch. He wasn't really outside the numbers, and Lad can do that as well. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think he's a necessarily a deep threat, but when you consider the fact that, like, he's got enough juice where if you press him and he wins off the line, he's going to get behind you. Yeah. And then he sells those double moves so well because he's mm -hmm. so dangerous on those out routes. So you don't want to get beat by that. Or if you try to jump it because you're like, you know what, I'm I'm sick of him beating right. me on these, then he's just going to go over the top. So good point in the chat, though, too. Like, they say, I like Lad, but I feel like he won't even be available in the second round. And the digs trade – that's going to expedite that, you know, second half of the first round wide receiver run even more because the Bills are going to have to go get a guy now. And you're right, a guy like Ladd might not even make it to pick 34. Yeah, I think the record is seven receivers taken in the first round, and we could probably see that this year because yeah, there's enough so talent. Yep. We know there's, like, depth. You can go in the second, like, even the fifth round, and there's going to be some good receivers available. But in terms of that top-end talent, like, Ladd, I think, is right on the edge of that group where – it's a very realistic chance that he's not even going to be there. It's funny, if like, you, you, we talk about the three, you know, quarterback, wide receiver, offensive tackle that the Patriots need. And it's like, oh, well, it's so deep in tackle and wide receiver, so they're going to be fine. But now we look at pick 34, and it's like all the good receivers, not all the good receivers because it's so deep, but those sort of tier one, day one receivers that you might think could leak into day two might not even be there because it's that much of a need all around the league. And wide receiver has become – you know, so I guess uh, so integral in offenses with the, you know, the way the passing game has changed. And now let's talk about the next tier receivers. I like this question. Okay. Xavier Leggett and Kieran Omegaji or Patrick Paul and Ricky Pearsall. Now, I think if you follow me on Twitter or watch the show regularly, you know, I'm big on Xavier Leggett. That's yep. my dude. I think when you talk about that next tier of receivers, maybe like the third tier where it's obviously those elite guys like right. Mitch J, Neighbors, and then Roma Dunze. Then you have the other guys like AD, um, Xavier Worthy. Brian like Thomas. Jackson, Brian Thomas. Yeah, yeah we're probably going to be in that next tier. Then the guys who you're thinking probably early second round, I think Xavier Leggett is really the only guy in that group who gives you both size mm -hmm. and legit explosiveness where not only is he dangerous underneath, but he can take the top off as well. I also love his ball skills and the size, his ability to go up and get the ball. Like, I feel like he can be your ex ISO guy, mm -hmm. but I would like him better in that Z role just because I feel like most offenses, if you really want to feature your star player, if they have position flexibility, you try to put them there as often as possible. And I like Kieran Omega G, although one thing that gives me pause is that he's projected to be a second round pick. Mm -hmm. But I know Brandon Thorne has him as more of a fourth rounder because coming from Yale, he thinks he's much more of a project. Okay. Which is what kind of worries me. Now, with Paul and Pearsall, I think Paul is someone who could probably start earlier, has more experience, although he still has some issues that need to be worked out. Might be available in the third, whereas, again, Kieran's kind of getting mocked in the second. Yep. Pearsall is also – I love his game. Like, separator, great hands, tough as hell. He'll get after it in the run game. Like, there's so many blocks that you'll see. Like, he has two or three a game where he helps spring big runs. Really like him as a prospect. It's just I don't love him underneath. Like, I just don't okay. – 
he's effective. I just don't think he gives you the same yak ability as someone like Aladdin McConkey, um, who, you know, I think they can get open down the field. Pearsall not as explosive, but can win on those double moves. Um, I, you know, I think that's a step down a bit, but I would go get in Kieran because I think Kieran and Paul are both guys that are probably going to be projects. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking to media contributors, I just like Xavier Leggett's upside more so than Pearsall, who, again, I do think is a fantastic player. Yeah, and I think you can sort of – you can piece together the offensive line a little bit more if guys aren't ready, whereas wide receiver, like, it's an immediate – more of an immediate need, I think, for the Patriots. I know we need the offensive line, but, like, you can still make it work. You've signed a couple guys where the Patriots wide receiver, I'm like – I know we brought in KJ Osborne, and look, I look forward to it too, but it's still a lot of, you know, twos, if not threes, where you still need a number one guy who can kind of do that. I like Leggett as well. Um, Patrick Paul, like, I remember before last season, and I know mock drafts are silly, especially before last season, but, like, Patrick Paul was being mocked in the first round at one point to the Patriots at, like, pick 12. And now he just, like, he continues to fall. He Like you said, he looks like a third, maybe fourth-round guy right now, and I don't even know why. Like, I – I really like Patrick Paul. I think he's, he, like you said, he has the experience. He played at Houston. So we played against, you know, better talent than um, Kieran did at Yale or uh, Yale, right? Am I losing my mind? <laughs> yeah, who's yeah. BYU? Oh, Kingsley. That's Kingsley. I, I, I get those guys mixed up for some reason because the colors and the, the BYU and the Yale, like it's just it happens to me too. Me, but um, too. I like Patrick Paul better, but I like Leggett better. So these, and the, these are these questions, man, the draft, like, what would you rather this guy or this guy or this guy or this guy? It's like, it's it's very close, but I, I think I'm on the same page as you because I think it is I think Leggett can uh can contribute more immediately. And I think it's okay if you if you drafted Kieran and you kind of let him develop a little bit more. Whereas Patrick Paul, stick him in day one. Pierre Saul might just be another addition as a you know, the the group of twos, if you will, on the Patriots wide yeah. receiver core. That's another thing. Like I think Leggett can develop into a one, whereas mm -hmm. I think Pearsall's ceiling is really that two, but like a Correct. really, really good two where he's going to catch passes. You know he's going to be a good pro. Yep. Probably not a pro bowler, but again, one of those guys where he's going to be beloved by the franchise. And I looked up uh, Brandon Thorne on Bleacher Report's scouting report on Patrick Paul in terms of his negatives. So okay. – is he's got an upright play style with an exposed chest and a propensity to hold defenders due to late looping hand placement that results in his hands landing high and wide on the target. You saw that a lot in the one-on-ones during the senior bowl. He uses what's called a hug technique, which basically is you're saying you're not going to get around me because I have enough of an anchor that you can like get into my chest and I'll just get down reset and be able to stop you once I get my feet in the ground and I'm kind of mm -hmm. reset. But when you see him do that, he still gets walked back very far into the pocket where it's like, okay, you're not really getting beat on your outside. But one, because the hand placement's off, you do have a bit of like, well, you can still get underneath him because he's got that eye hand placement and you don't necessarily want to see him get walked back as often as he does. So that is one thing that really stands out for me. Um, says he needs to do a better job of maximizing his length and keeping defenders at his fingertips rather than allowing them access into his frame again exposing his chest consistently right. but it's just i don't know if he knows how to do it in a sense where he's not really putting himself at a disadvantage head dips in overextension on angle drive and base blocks against post snap movement across his face so that's one thing you really don't want to see from tackles we saw it a lot with Vidari and low and mm -hmm. calvin anderson where they kind of try to shoot it guys and then you dip your head and once your head's down you really don't have control over the rep and smart defenders especially if they can time that they're going to be able to take advantage and that's what leads to those really ugly losses a bad habit of drifting and oversetting on angled or 45 degree sets, creating a soft inside shoulder against counter moves. So again, sometimes he's just doing a little too much and yeah. then it closes himself inside. And last can get a little lazy at the top of the quarterback's drop, letting his pads rise before falling off late on inside moves. So the sustain isn't really there and he can lose later in the reps. And you think about, you know, putting those th two things together, right? Like he, you start, you know, you try and do a little too much. And so you lose your footing or you lose whatever. And then you also get lazy at the top of the drop and you can't recover in time. So you just kind of end up with a disaster of a rep and like, you know, you just want more consistency there overall. So yeah, bad recipe, but still a talented player. And with Scott Peters, you brought him in because he learned under Brian Callahan, one of the greatest offensive line coaches of all time. So yep. hoping it translates. And I mean, the guy literally has his own side business where he teaches technique, which is, yeah. you know, very encouraging, but we'll see how he does with his own. Do you feel the Patriots have a real plan on how they'll go about addressing the skill positions? And do you have any favorites? What do you think, buddy? All right. I am, I mean, again, this is this is just my feel. This is not really informed. I just think that there's still a chance that they go get a number one wide receiver. I said this uh, a couple weeks ago here on this show when we when I was on the last mailbag that I did. Like, 
I just think there there wasn't enough of a pop in free agency, and they do have money to spend still. And I know it's going to carry over, and I know you want to get your rookie quarterback in, and um, you want to sort of, I guess, save that money and have it down the line so that, you know, call it Drake May, say he hits. You can do what the Texans did and continue to spend around him like they're doing for CJ Stroud now. So maybe you wait a year. But look, they... I still have a feeling they could go make a move for a T Higgins or a Brandon Ayuk. I just do. And so those are my two favorites. I think that's how they'll address the skill position. And whether you use number 34, whether you use a second round next year or whether, you know, I, look, I, I'm not a compensation expert. So like, I, I don't know exactly what it's going to take for those guys. I know that um, the digs deal, like you said, set a little bit of a market, but it's different because um, of the way that, you know, again, Higgins has requested a trade and, um, Ayuk's contract situation and things like that. So you're going to have to make the trade and then you're going to have to sign these guys to an extension. And I think that's how you have to do it. I mean, you look at guys like AJ Brown and Tyreek Hill, who I mentioned before, like that's what you do. That's how you have to get a receiver. You're not going to, and Ke Calvin Ridley would have been great, but you know, it's, it's not often that those guys just hit the market because they're that important to an offense. You have to trade for them or you have to draft and develop. And I know what that that's what the Patriots want to do here, especially with, you know, the Elliott Wolf front office is draft and develop, but you should still go get a proven guy for, for your, your rookie, or your rookie quarterback, excuse me. So that's sort of my, um, my thoughts on it. That's how they should address it. Will they, we'll have to wait and see, but there's still time like free agency, the draft. It's really only just beginning. It's only April 5th. So there's plenty of time for them to make a move. When it comes to receivers, tight ends, or running backs, who are some guys, obviously, like we talk about the veterans, but looking at the draft, who are some guys that you're like, I really would love to see them in a Patriots uniform catching passes from hopefully Drake? Oh, man. Um, I, I do like A.D. Mitchell. I do like Brian Thomas. Those are guys who I look at like, okay, that you're not going to go get a veteran, but you're going to be aggressive in the second half of the, or the, yeah, the second half of the first round. Use 34, use some more assets and trade up guys like that. Like Brian Thomas – He's fast. He's big. He can be an X. He can be a Z. Like, I feel like he can do so much. And uh, he's also super fast for his size. And so I look at sort of the tiers of wide receivers. I think I really have him as like a back end tier one guy instead of the tier two guy. Like, I like him a lot. So will he be there? I don't know. But um, that's a guy who I would love to see paired up with Drake May. Tight ends. I mean, look, I love, I think Brock Bauer, I think it's Brock Bowers in a gap. I know they're not going to get Brock Bowers, um, so you kind of have to take him off the board. But I think he is just number one without a doubt. Um, they are they do have a visit lined up. I don't know if you saw before he came on with Jared Wiley from TCU. Yeah. Um, so that's a guy who super athletic can uh, can move all around. It, it, I saw Evan Lazar talking about how he you know he hits the seam really well. Like that's a an athletic fast um, wide receiver that I can see them bringing into, especially now that they have interest in him. But um, as far as wide receivers, like I love AD Mitchell and I love Brian Thomas. Yeah, in terms of the plan, I think they really do want to get that veteran receiver. I just think the mm -hmm. situation that they're in where they're rebuilding. I know. And even if you talk about a trade, I feel like most of the times teams try to give a receiver some level of say, like they don't want to really send them to a wasteland like a Patriots right. where, you know, the reputation and the shine's kind of worn off in recent years. And again, they don't mm -hmm. have a quarterback situation. So with the T. Higgins and with a Brandon Ayuk, if he's even on the market, I think it makes more sense for Debo to be on the market. But right. I still don't think those teams would really want to trade those guys to New England unless New England just offered them like, you know, crazy good compensation. Right. I think they'd want to find some middle ground with, all right, where does the, would the player like to go? And how can we also get good acquis or um, some good capital? So, right. You know, I think they want to do that, but I just don't think it's really on the table for them. So I think their main plan is to build through the draft because then you get cheap talent. You get guys yeah. to come up in your system. They know your way of doing business. They can help be a part of the, of the you know, the culture that you're trying to reset. And this is a really talented class as well. Like, I, know. I think that that's like throughout the draft, you see it. If you're going to talk about some skill positions I like, I really want them to get, again, that uh, – explosiveness and size on the outside. And even if it's not necessarily explosiveness, someone who has some kind of vertical ability. So like Xavier Leggett and Javon Baker, are like two of my guys where I'm like, yeah. I really, really hope they can get one or both of those guys. But even later in the draft, you look at like a Brendan Rice, who's not the fastest guy, but he can play that true X. He's physical. He draws a bunch of penalties and he's got enough speed that he can get over the top. And you know, as long as he wins early on in the route or he wins in his stem, uh, you look at someone like, uh, uh, Bub Means from Pitt, 
Obviously, another guy who has good size, build up speed, but he's good against press, so that's not as much of an issue. Um, and then you can go even later to a guy I'm looking at the list right now. Yeah. Uh, Jordan Coker, I know he's on the he's in the chat right now. People are talking about him. Yeah, the pro day, yeah. Monster. He kind of reminds me of Devontae Parker, to be honest, a little bit shiftier. No, <laughs> it might scare some people, but in terms of the route tree, we're like Devontae like slants and fades all day. Sure. I feel like he's similar in that regard. So that's the kind of skill set I'd like to see them add. And you can get those kinds of guys throughout the draft, like literally day one, day two, day three. You mentioned the guys that they wanted to trade back into the first they could get. Right. And then the tight ends. Like we know that uh, Alex Van Pelt likes his heavy sets. Yep. Patriots don't really have a future at tight end outside of Hunter Henry, so maybe they double dip. Mm -hmm. This is a class with so much athleticism and upside, which at tight end, considering a lot of these guys don't really break out until after their first contract, like you're willing to bet on the upside especially if they can contribute early on as blockers, because then it's all right, let's develop their game as receivers. They don't need to be featured, but we know we can at least get them on the field. You talk about like a Theo Johnson, Jaheim Bell. Uh, I love Theo Johnson. I think he's a guy with so much upside. Like he, he doesn't have a lot of production, but he's he killed the combine. And some people hate the numbers of the combine, but he is just such a freak athlete that it's almost like a guy who, if he's there for you in round four, bring him in work with them, see what happens, because that's a guy who just has, like, infinite upside, in my opinion. If he even lasts that long. I've been I know. talking about him going in the – like, him and Ben Senator, guys, I thought would be more fourth-rounders. They're getting second-round buzz. And if you really need a tight end and you're like, I don't really want to risk it, and I'm not sure if it's a great investment, but at the same time, if it's a good fit for a team, you know, I might not have so much trouble with it. And then Tip Raymond, another guy who yeah, tested yeah. out out of this world – I don't know how much that translates to his receiving game, although I think he's got flashes. Maybe he's got more, again, upside because of that athleticism. He has soft hands. He's so big. He's a massive target. So there might be more upside there, but he's the best blocker in the class. You can probably get him on day three, like middle to late day three. So, And that's the thing with this, the receivers and the tight ends. And I think that, you know, as Patriots fans and as Patriots reporters, like, you kind of get scarred by the Nikhil Harrys and the Taekwon Thorntons or the double dip at tight end with Devin Asiasi and Dalton Keene. But it's like, you look at the Packers and it, we keep, we always go to the Packers because of Wolf's history there. But, and he wasn't even there when they did this, but like they brought in Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, Jaden Reed over the last two, three seasons. And those guys are built like they're using those guys to build around Jordan Love. And they pretty much hit on all three of them. And so that's like a, you know, that none of them are, I guess tier one wide receivers right now, but they have a a top to bottom really solid core that helped Jordan Love grow over the court the second half of last season. So like if you can do that with your rookie quarterback, that's ju almost just as good as going to get a tier one wide receiver and then having a bunch of twos and threes. If you got have a bunch of one A's or I guess two A's if you will, um, you know alongside them. So. Yeah. So to put a bow on it, the feel for the plan is to build through the draft. I feel like that has been the yeah. plan. It's the smartest way to do business because then you don't have to overpay for guys inevitably in free agency. And then again, our favorites. I mean, there's guys throughout this yeah. uh, draft class. Just hit on picks. That's the thing. That's the plan. Hit on the damn picks and you know, you're going to have some success here. And even if they get Drake May, like you look at that second round pick, I talked about it yesterday with Alex, but like that may be your most valuable pick because you yeah. can flip that and then get more capital in that top 100, top 120 kind of range where there is a lot of talent mm -hmm. and you can start addressing the defense. I think they're going to do that anyway, but sure, you can sure. double dip, address defense and really have a well-rounded class of guys that can contribute early on. Uh, so yeah, I like did a lot you of see, uh Did you see Evans, Evan Lazar's tweet yesterday about how like the similarities between the 2020 Bengals and the 2024 pay or the 2023 Patriots. No, it was like, how can the Patriots rebuild, not rebuild fast, but like, what is a blueprint for what they have to do right now? And he pointed out the 2020 Bengals roster and how shot it was and that they had pick one and they had pick 33. And then they hit on Joe Burrow. They hit on T Higgins. And then the next year they weren't that great. And they hit on Jamar chase. And then they just yeah. built up some guys through free agency. And like, that's kind of what I look at with the Patriots right now. Like, yeah. you could hit on your quarterback at three. You could hit on a, a T. Higgins-like player at 34. Next year is probably not going to be great, but that's okay. You get another pick, and then you start to rebuild from there. Like there, And they Bengals went to the Super Bowl two years later. So there is hope here. There is, you know, this is not – it's not unprecedented for the Patriots to be able to turn this thing around. Not quickly, but, you know, rebuild it like other teams have in the past. And these receiver classes are always loaded. And I've been saying, I don't think they're going to get their real wide receiver one of the future until next year. 
And if they're not that good and they have like a top 15, top 10 pick, then you use that and you get your real receiver. Once you get your developmental tackle, who you think could probably play year two, right. you get your really good, like wide receiver two type, something like that. So I think that is a good point where, you know, first you get your building blocks, your quarterback, a good receiver, and then you start really rounding it out in that second year. Yep. Uh, we got some more fantastic questions as always, but first got to pay the bills, send it to our friends at prize picks. Be right back. Prize Picks is America's number one sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get out of the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings rolled in. Now get in on the playoff action. Win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 in just a few taps. Prize picks is really simple to play. You can make a pick and submit an entry in less than 60 seconds. This week on Prize Picks, I'm selecting Jason Tatum to dish out more than five assists and for his teammate Jalen Brown to have more than 22 and a half points. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit matchup to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Prize picks. All right, now this is a fun one. We all know offense is a key need, but safety and corners are also low-key needs. Mm -hmm. Who are some prospects in the draft we could have an eye on to fill a Devin McCourty role? And I'll even add this. Andrew Callahan did report that Kyle Duggar isn't happy with the transition tag and floated the idea of him potentially being someone who could be traded before the draft. Now, probably going to get like a fourth-round pick for him, obviously. Like, Duggar's 28 years old. Right. The, he's flexible, but he does have that part of his game where you don't really want him in the deep part of the field, at least not as a really a center fielder. You'd like him close to the line of scrimmage. I still think he's a best suited in New England because I think they really oh, maximize the skill set with their scheme. But at the same time, it's not just that Devin McCourty role. You also might need to find a way to supplement Duggar. Now, you can do that maybe with Mapu and Peppers to some degree. Right. And I think that McCourty role, either way, is probably one they want to fill to maximize Peppers if he doesn't have to play there that often. But, uh, yeah, so for corner and safety, who are some guys that you have on your list that you think are pretty interesting? Um, I, I like the – I guess the second tier corners. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously guys like, uh, you know, Quinion Mitchell and Terry and Arnold are going to go early and those aren't, you know, the guys for the Patriots, but like one guy I've had my eye on for a while here at like around the pick 100 uh, is Cam Hart from Notre Dame. He's turned into one of my favorite corners in the class. I just think that he's, he's a really good um, guy who you could, plug and play early like I, I don't see him being a day one starter but if you develop him into a guy who's on the outside on the other side of Christian Gonzalez then there's that whole trickle down effect in the cornerback room that you know we'd like to see like Jonathan Jones more comfortable in the slot Marcus Jones um, more comfortable as you know a backup gadget punt returner player instead of having him be your top sort of slot cornerback guy right and so the cornerback room last year looked really good on paper but it fizzled out fast with Jack Jones and JC Jackson and Marcus Jones getting hurt. Christian Gonzalez obviously gets hurt. And then, um, you know, guys like Alex Austin and Sean Wade really had to fill in and they, you know, they, they did fine, but you want to beef it up even more. And so if you can bring a guy like camp Harden, in the, then you, like I just mentioned that you don't have to play Jonathan Jones on the outside who, again, he plays pretty well on the outside, but he's more comfortable inside. That's just kind of the ideal situation for him uh, for the Patriots defense. So uh, long story short, I like a guy like Cam Hart to bring in as, as a corner. Yeah, so I'm a different outside guy. I like Chris Abrams' drain, and it's because okay. there's so much Jack Jones, I think, in his game. Oh, I, I remember you talking about him the other day. Yeah, because he's yeah. someone I think they also either – I think they met with him at his pro day, or there has been some interaction, so sure. we know they're interested. So I took a look at him, and again, like Jack Jones, he's a converted wide receiver. So the okay. ball skills, like how quickly he comes back and tries to find the ball, how quickly he is able to locate it, and then actually turn that into turnovers, really interesting. It's not the kind of like a lot of the time turnover stats can be fluky and in interceptions because, you know, and even some of his where it's like just a bad throw from the quarterback that he capitalizes on. One, quarterbacks aren't perfect, so you do want guys right. who can take advantage of those opportunities, but at the same time. He's a fluid athlete. He trusts his athleticism. He can carry guys deep downfield. He's really feisty as a tackler. I really like him in that regard. Now, like Jack Jones, he also needs to put on some weight. He's kind of mm -hmm. more of a wiry guy. That's going to be an issue where guys are going to be able to box him out. You see there's times where, you know, he tries to make plays at the catch point and guys just kind of 
boxing out and he can't get through their frame. So that's going to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think he can contribute early on in that role where he's a rotational kind of boundary guy. Although I do think he can play the run. Again, like Jack Jones, he's a smaller guy, but he wasn't afraid to really mix it up, although he could Perfect. get the yeah. play. So and I, I like the I like the idea that you mentioned about being a former receiver. I think that's like a low key, like not huge, but something that, you know, when you get into the weeds on guys and you find out, you know, what makes them tick and how how good of players they are, like having that wide receiver in you as a cornerback, it makes you more aggressive. You understand a little bit more like how guys want to run their routes and how they want to use leverage and where they want to break things off. Um, instead of just yeah. using the film you watch and sort of your teaching, you've been on that side of the ball uh, right. before. And then the ability to pick the ball off. Like the, the people say that cornerbacks are just wide receivers who can't freaking catch the ball. But if you can catch the ball as a cornerback, you're that much more able to not only go up and defend a ball, but actually bring it down and cause a turnover for your team. And then not only that, not even just the ball skills, but he really is very smooth in coverage, can play different yeah. techniques as well. And we know the Patriots, they're a man defense, but they like to switch in some zone looks, like some cover two. Obviously, everybody mostly plays cover three in the NFL, just so you can get that extra box on the run and be safe from zone. And mix in some quarters, not a ton. Obviously, there could be some schematic changes, but I think they're still going to want to be able to be multiple in that way. And then looking at safeties, Cameron Kinchins is my guy. Yeah, One, right. Alonzo Highsmith. Miami, right? with him. Yeah. Yep, out of Miami, so Alonzo Highsmith knows him. But in terms of that center field role, I love his range. I like his intelligence, his rep recognition. He can get himself in trouble because he is aggressive and sometimes he won't take the best angles to the ball, which is a problem with a lot of college safety. Sometimes that's something you got to work into them, mm -hmm. but you can teach the ball skills. Uh, his physicality, I really like where, you know, Devin McCourty was a sound tackler, but Kinchins, like when he hits guys, they stop, which yeah. I love to see, especially from defensive backs when they tackle. He's got good size. If you're talking about Kyle Duggar no longer being on the team, I like Marte Mapu covering tight ends, but Kinchins, I think, gives you more physicality, and he is really smooth in those man coverage situations. And again, like a Devin McCourty, where a lot of the time they would really have Harmon as the center fielder mm -hmm. in obvious pass situations, and then have Devin McCourty play more of a robber or cut in the middle where he would be taking away those crossing routes and just reading quarterbacks and making plays on the ball. Yes. That's where Duggar thrives. I think Kinchins is really good there as well. Just versatile guy, physical, uh, good tackler. He has ball skills and good recognition. I think he's a really interesting prospect. So if Another guy I'll throw in then, too, if, uh, if we're going to go back and forth. I see it from the chat. It made me kind of remember. It's Mikey San Ristel from uh, Michigan. Oh, oh, my God. That's another guy who's just a baller. Like, they had just gamers on that Michigan team. Like, all the offensive side of the ball, I think of Blake Corum is that, like, mm -hmm. not too big. I guess he's strong, but he's just a good football player. That's what Mikey St. Russell is. He also used to play wide receiver. He's from Everett, Massachusetts, interesting enough. Oh, yeah, that's uh, right. So a little local connection there. But, I mean, I could see him as a corner. I could see him play safety as well because, again, he's just a football player. And when you get into these, you know, fourth, fifths, I mean, I don't think St. Russell is going to fall to the sixth round. But, mm -hmm. like, when you get sort of past the top-tier blue-chip talent, just take guys that can play ball, right? And I think St. Russell could do that all across the defensive backfield for them. If the Patriots had, like, they took that Godfather offer and then were able to flip a bunch of picks and had a second rounder where it's yeah. like, okay, you get your great tackle, you get two first round picks, and you can address those. That's where I'm like, with that second pick, there's going to be so much really good yeah, immediate yeah. starting talent. Mm -hmm. Like, Chop Robinson's another guy yeah, where yeah. I kind of look at like just defenders. I'm like, ooh, I really wish they had more flexibility. But Sanders still is I one know. of those guys where I always see him on the board in the second round, and I'm like, I really want him. He's a dog, man. And in yeah, that like is. kind of Miles Bryant role where he brings the toughness, he can blitz, yep, just yep. a great physical presence who's smart. Man, I don't think they can get him because I, I, I just know. think he's in the range where they're going to have to address offensive needs. But I agree. I think Sanders still is fantastic, and he's a flexible guy. So yeah. I think he's like he plays outside in base groupings and then can kick inside when you play Nick. Correct, so. yeah. Oh, man, now I'm kind of sick. Yeah. I know they can't get him, but he's – I he's know, really I want him. That would be a good little homecoming for him, too, playing, playing in Massachusetts High School. But Maybe he'll figure something out. Who knows? Yeah. Fingers crossed. What would Matt Judon's value be in a trade? Round one or two pick? He's still a stud, but by the time the Pats are ready to compete again, he'll be gone or likely so down significantly. I, I think the rest of it got cut off. He's not getting – it's not going to be that high. I know. Yeah, it's no, you'd be lucky to get a fourth, I think, because of the age, because of the injuries. Like, maybe in Madden you could get a second-round pick for him, but I don't think – especially when you look at his game last season, I think the run defense kind of dipped, and I think a lot of his value is the fact that he can play every down. We'll see if that's better this season, mm -hmm. uh, but especially as a pass rusher. Now, he does mostly thrive on, like, line games, so I don't think, like, you know, it is a bicep. It's not like it's a lower body injury, which is mm -hmm. good, uh, but at the same time, I think – 
his game will still translate and I think he'll still be successful, but I think he's pretty much going to live on like one year deals or two year deals that are really one year deals. Even if he does end up retiring with new England. Cause that's the really thing I, I spoke with Jude on the other day and wrote it up for wei.com. Mm -hmm. So if you guys uh, haven't check it out there, it was on Tuesday and he, you mentioned like retiring a Patriot. You know, when I asked him about the contract, that's what he told me. He was like, kind of sounded like he wasn't going to play hardball like he did last year, but you know, some of that's just his talk agents talk kind of stuff. But he also mentioned again, the retiring in new England, but that involves them, you know, giving a multi-year deal, giving him some financial security, which allows him to stay here. And like you mentioned, coming off the injury, being 31 years old, I don't know if they're going to offer that to him. So you, you, like you said, yeah, you try and trade him. as far as the value. It's not going to be around one or two pick. You're hundred percent, right? Maybe a late third, maybe a fourth. Like I, I, again, I'm not the the compensate trap trade compensation expert, but like it's not going to be that high of a pick. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's the age, it's the injury. Um, I would like him around here. He is a stud. He can play well. Um, you mentioned the dip, but uh, if they can keep him around, great. I just don't see it being a, um, like I said, a long term deal. It's going to be you know kind of play it one year, two years down the line. So we'll see what happens. And if he does want to be here, I feel like that's just the best situation because, you know, Definitely. he's going to a championship team, but if that's not what his aspirations are, like keep him around. He's not going to be that expensive. Exactly. Do you think Zappi will be on the 53 or do you think he'll be cut in the process or even earlier? Personally, I don't see why you get rid of Zappi unless he's a problem in the locker room, which exactly. we did not hear that he was. Any problems right. we heard about the quarterback room really stemmed from Mac. And Zappi, if anything, was going into the wide receiver room. And spending that time to bond with guys. We know he's right. putting in work this offseason to work with guys. So he's going to have a head start over Brissett and whoever the rookie is. You know, in camp, sometimes that's all you want, where you just want to be able to run things. Unless you know for sure who your starter is going to be, sometimes you just want that consistency where you know that guys have timing and it just helps the offense flow mm -hmm. rather than putting somebody in there where it's going to be kind of rocky because they don't have that experience. Now, again, if they say we want Jacoby to be our starter early on or we want Drake May to at least see what he can do when we mix it in, there's that, but Zappy has chemistry with these guys. And if they have the playbook already, then he's going to have a huge head start. Exactly. And on top of that, we saw he's not a bad spot starter. Like this guy helped them win games and was competitive with a really bad supporting cast, terrible offensive line, Ramondre Stevenson, Hunter Henry, and Kendrick Bourne were either already gone or were lost while he was playing. He's throwing like Jalen Rager. And, you know, Demario Douglas at that point was their top guy. So, I just don't really see the benefit of getting rid of Zappy when he's cost controlled. He seems like he wants to be here and the mm. guys like him. Again, as yeah. long as he's open to being like, I mean, the guy's a fourth round pick. There's only so much you can, you know, huff and puff when you're a fourth round pick and you want to start. Like put the work in and earn it. And if you don't or you don't like the situation, then sure, maybe move on from him. But he, he's going to be a team player and say, hey, I'll do whatever the team asked me to do and I'll fill my role. It mm -hmm. makes no sense to me to get rid of Bailey. It, so, yeah, it's going to it's gonna depend on Wolf and Mayo and really Van Pelt's roster building philosophy when you get down to cut day. I don't see Zappi being a summertime cut. I don't see him being traded right now. I don't see any of that. And I don't see him being a problem in the locker room either. Like, like you mentioned, he's been working out with guys. Guys like him. He doesn't... Um, you know, he doesn't do some of the things that people may have, you know, accused Mac of doing last year and kind of being what have you. But like when it comes down to, you know, August 28th or whatever, are they going to want to keep two quarterbacks or they're going to want to keep three quarterbacks? If they're going to want to keep three quarterbacks, you keep Zappy on the roster. I think he knows his place. I think he understands why he's here. I think he sees Brissett come in and he sees that they have the number three overall pick. And if he can understand that, look, I'm going to be a developmental player, a guy who can be come in when, when, uh, somebody's hurt, a guy that can be a camp arm and a you know season long sort of locker room guy. Then yeah, I don't see why they need to get rid of him. On the other hand, if you're gonna cut, if you're only gonna keep two quarterbacks, then Zappi's gonna be the guy that you're gonna cut because you're gonna keep the rookie and you're gonna keep Brissett. Right. Um, and then if if he clears waivers, bring him back in the practice squad. Easy, like just like they did last season, uh, because he is a good enough player to be. Um, at least rostered in the NFL on your system, in your system, whether it be the 53 or the practice squad. I do think if he gets cut again, he's going to be like, all right, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. I'm getting the hell out of here. Yeah, that's um, fair. <laughs> but, and I also just think this quarterback room, it makes sense to keep three people. Like you've got your veteran. Yeah. You might get hurt because as we saw last season, Jacoby Brissett did have the hamstring issue. And if Drake may struggles and then Jacoby's hurt, at least you have somebody who has a clean bill of health 
you know, who will have had some time in the system and sure. who you know, again, can be at least a decent spot starter for you, push the ball downfield and, you know, take advantage of a QB friendly offense, which is really what Van Pelt has. Right. All right. What first round graded player, first round graded player could you not pass on at 34? That is not a quarterback, offensive tackle or wide receiver. My guys are Brock Bowers, Cooper DeGene or Jared Verse. Who you got, Mike? Um, there's no way Brock Bowers gets there, so I'm going to take him out of consideration. Um, Fair. If he was there, I'd take him. I think he's an absolute stud, but yeah. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go Jared Verse, and it's going to piss people off because it's a defender, but I love like Jared Verse. Yeah. I like him a lot. He went to U Albany. He, uh, I was listening to an interview with him uh, with Chris Sims and Florio from uh, – from was it combine week or Super Bowl week or whatever it was. And like he went to Albany, he was tiny, COVID hit, and he went home. And he was like, Me and my dad just went in the weight room every single day. And I lifted every single day and I put on X amount of weight. And then when COVID was over, we came back for camp the next season and everyone looked at me like, What, you just go on a steroid, like a steroid <laughs> bender when you were gone at home during lockdown? It was like, He was like, No, I just worked my ass off. And so the guy's a worker. He played well at Albany. Gets to transfer to Florida State. Last year was going to be a first-round pick. Stayed at school. Performed again. Still a first-round talent this year. Like, stayed consistent. Went back and proved it again. So, I love Jared Verse. I love what he can do on the outside as a rusher. Now, are the Patriots going to take an edge rusher at 34? No, they're probably not. But out of these three guys, or out, I'm sorry, I guess out of DeGene and Verse, because I don't see Bowers being there, I would take Jared Verse. I'm going to go Darius Robinson out of Missouri. Oh, Okay. He's kind of in that like Dietrich Wise mold of like he can play on the edge. Yes, that's that was my comp for him when I when I studied the DNs. He's like he's everywhere along the uh, the defensive line, and he's long. I mm -hmm. think he's more powerful and holds his ground better than Dietrich does. And I really like one just the physicality, like it really jumps out. He's got like that technician kind of profile where he's really good with his hands. Um, not the best athlete. Again, it kind of in that Dietrich mold where you kind of move him around to make up for that. But sure, he's got sure. good size. Like his length is really good. He can get bigger if you need him to as well. And again, those long arms so he can keep guys outside of his body. He's really strong. Like you can see him dominate some guys. So probably I'd go Darius Robinson. I think he's okay. a really fun player. Could potentially slip out of the first round just because there's so much offensive talent at like yeah. tackle receiver. You can see a lot of quarterbacks end up going. So I feel like a lot of defensive talent is going to get pushed. Again, we know that we're probably not going to get any defenders. Out yeah, of I know. Well, it's funny, though. Dude, me, me, you, and Zanis were on this stream a year ago, and it, it was the three needs. It was corner, and they hit it, and then it was wide receiver tackle, and then they just went defense, defense, defense. And, again, it can't happen again. I don't see right. it happening, but it happened to us a year ago, so maybe it happens again. Who knows? Hope they learn from a mistake. Yeah, right. All right, we're going to end with a fun one. Okay. Oh, my God, something happened to the rest of the tweet. Um, okay, we'll just go with it. And okay. we'll, I think we're just gonna have to guess to see why well, I'm guessing this would be what the end result would be. So let's play what if and you get to be Jeffrey Wright. So I'll use the voice. What if the Bears don't take Caleb Williams, but another quarterback instead? And then what would happen after that? Assuming, um, if they don't go Caleb Williams first, I honestly just think it's Caleb Williams second. Like I was going to say Washington Cliff Kingsbury is just going to take Caleb and that's what yeah. it is. And then you end up with the third guy again. It's pretty straightforward, but I would I wouldn't I was gonna make this like would you take Caleb Williams if he falls through? I think it's pretty obvious that everybody would take Caleb Williams if he fell with three. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of any situation where he wouldn't. I think maybe he does have some of that, like, oh my god, why is he making this throw that Drake may gets a lot of crap for, but I think you see way more in Caleb Williams game, which partially is because it's that arrogance where he knows he can make a lot of crazy plays and he's got nuts arm talent he can make people miss and all that kind of good stuff but yeah at the same time i just all right not so really then sure. what if chicago takes drake may and washington takes caleb williams are you more uh i guess motivated to pick up the phone and try and trade back if it's Jaden daniels or are you just continuing to make the pick honestly yeah and i i i it's tough because there's a lot to like about Jane Daniels game. I know. Like if you want a guy who like mechanically is sound is going to stand in the pocket, do what he's got to do, can process the defense pretty well. Like that's where I think Jaden is the creme de la creme of the top quarterbacks where he can do those things consistently. I think Caleb Williams does it way more than he gets credit for. Yeah, but I yeah, think from yeah. a consistent basis, like Jaden being able to play in that LSU offense where he could be more comfortable and do those kinds of things. 
I, I think he's got that, but it's really just the upside where it's like, how much bigger can he get? Can his arm strength really get that much better? Like, I really think that's going to limit him, especially when you talk about playing in Boston, where we know that later in the year, arm talent is going to be a big factor because you yep. need to drive that ball in the wind, in the snow, what have you. We saw with Bailey Zappi where he couldn't really do it. As soon as they're throwing against the wind, he can't really hit downfield. And then once they throw into the wind, he completes his first deep attempt. So, yeah, I, I would like to maybe trade like just a couple spots. Maybe, you know, people try to grab receivers and tackles mm -hmm. and then you get Jaden later. And it's also a range where maybe you're not going to get beat by somebody trying to trade up. Uh, but yeah, I unfortunately would be more inclined to trade. Yeah. Although if they pick Jaden, like I'll talk myself into it. I don't think it's going to be all that hard. 100%. It's just the upside that he has really scares me. I feel like he's way more floor um, than he is necessarily ceiling. Oh, we'll go with one of this one as well. Um, did you guys get to attend the local prospect pro day? We didn't get to, but is there anybody who's attending the local prospect pro days who you think is really interesting? We already talked about him, but Jalen Coker is interesting to me. I, I like him as a player. I think it's uh, another local tie with Foley Cross is pretty cool, but you need you need wide receivers. So if you want to talk about this double dip thing, he's a later round guy that I could see them taking a swing on. Uh, you mentioned the way he's, you know, sort of like your prototypical X. They need that. So use him as a developmental piece in your wide receiver game. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw out Jalen Coker. And I'll say Danny Abraham out of Villanova. He's an interesting one. Okay. There weren't a lot of guys that I could find any video on, but he was somebody where the Patriots seemed to be spending a lot of time looking at like lower school prospects at linebacker who are really athletic and explosive. Yeah. I think they're going to try to integrate some of that in their offense because like even Sione Takitaki, where his strength partially isn't coverage because he's really instinctive, he's not really rangy. He's got good range, and that's more accentuated by the fact that he's in good position. They don't really have like a Mac Wilson type where they're really great athletes other than Marte Mapu and some of those dime packages. Sure. Now with Abraham, what I like about him is that he has that like really good speed. He can spy. He's got range and coverage. He's got ball skills. Uh, you can use him as a blitzer. Now, I don't like the fact that he can, like, sometimes he's so fast to the ball, kind of overrun plays. He doesn't do a great job of circling back. I think his tackling is definitely going to need work. So as an early down player, I don't love his profile right now. Um, but I really do like the physical tools. I think he's an interesting guy. So keep an eye out on those kinds of prospects as the Patriots again. Yep. Really looking at those athletic linebackers from those smaller schools. But, Mike, buddy, going to wrap this one up. Great time. Please let the There's people both. know where they can find you. Plug the pod one more time and let them know uh, what other great stuff you got coming down the pipe. All right. Uh, follow on Twitter at Mike Cadlick. Uh, all my Patriots coverage at WEI.com and the Six Rings and Football Things podcast with Fitzy and Andy Hart. And uh, starting my own venture in the podcast world, too, the Behind the Mic podcast. Peeling back the curtain on the sports media industry, interviewing the top sports media personalities, not only in Boston, but the entire country, trying to find out more about them, how they got into the industry, what they do outside of football, uh, sports, really, because we're not just sticking to football, we're doing it all. So follow along at Behind Mike Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Subscribe to the Behind the Mike podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, you can subscribe on YouTube as well at Behind Mike Pod. So it's going to be fun. We had Mike Reese on the pod week one. We have another one coming next Wednesday, so we're going to try and make it a weekly thing. So uh, any support, any follows, retweets, whatever you want to do, uh, I appreciate the support. So, uh, yeah, that's what we got. First episode was great. Can't wait to see the next one. Thank you appreciate so much, it. buddy. And thank you all, as always, for watching. Now, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other.